keynote speaker, Ross Hardison. Uh, so Ross uh, obtained his PhD in Iowa uh, in 1977, uh, I believe. <laughs> Uh, from there, he went uh, uh, to work with Tom Maniatis uh, in a short stint at Case Western. I understand uh, that was the short stint that uh, Maniatis Group was, was there. Uh, oh, Caltech, sorry, sorry. Um, and then um, by the early 80s, or 1980, he was at Penn State University, uh, and he's been there ever since. Uh, Tom. Uh, Ross, sorry, was, uh, was involved with the um, initial sequencing of the rat genome paper um, and really was instrumental uh, in the uh, comparison at that point between the, the mouse, human, and rat genome. So the, the rat genome paper had a lot of comparative uh, genomics uh, work and uh, a lot of that uh, uh, was, was led by uh, Ross's group. Uh, and so. Uh, now uh, we're going to hear about, I hope, the, the next level. Um, uh, Ross more recently has been involved with the ENCODE project um, on trying to understand uh, gene regulation uh, in, a, in a variety of, uh, of different, uh, different ways. And so I don't have the title of your talk in front of me. Um, oh, there it is. Uh, so the genomics of hematopoietic gene regulation, uh, translating uh, from animal models to humans. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, thank you, Aaron, for that introduction. Thanks to uh, the, the organizers for uh, the, uh, inviting me to come. It's, it has been a while since I was at the rat genomics meeting, and uh, I am, uh, you know, starting to get reacquainted with uh, with several folks, and uh, I'm looking forward to a wonderful meeting. It looks looks great. Now, um, the, well, let's just go on to, to the next slide. I'm going to be, my starting point for this talk is work that I've been uh, engaged with for several years. It's been wonderful collaborative work with uh, Mitch Weiss and Garrett Blobel at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, uh, Yu Zhang and others at Penn State, uh, James Taylor, who's moving up to Hopkins now, and David Bodine. And, and we've really been focused on uh, hematopoiesis in uh, actually in mouse, everything I'm talking about is mouse, but I think it's going to be relevant to, to, to the rat uh, meeting here as well. And, uh, and, and we're looking at lots of different epigenetic features and trying to tie them in with uh, uh, patterns of uh, uh, gene expression and trying to understand really fundamental questions about lineage specification uh, and, and, and what's driving, a after commitment, what's driving cells to uh, uh, assume their, their uh, full mature phenotypes. And we've also been working with both the mouse and uh, human uh, ENCODE projects. And we're getting lots of data just like uh, uh, so many people at this meeting are as well. There are some abiding issues that I'm just really going to be more the theme. So I'm not really going to tell you that much about hematopoiesis per se, but rather from the work that we're doing in that, what's that telling us about relationships between mammalian species in terms of their regulatory mechanisms, and how is that impacting our ability to translate what we're seeing in our model organisms to, to humans? And I hope this is going to uh, uh, dovetail well with what uh, Howard Jacob, I think, the, the, in, the la in the last talk of the uh, meeting will be uh, dealing with. So, so that's where we're headed. And um, so this was my starting point with all this. Ten years ago, uh, the uh, Rat uh, Genome Sequencing Consortium was uh, actively working away. Uh, I didn't do any of the sequencing <laughs> or any of the other things, but uh, Webb Miller and myself uh, and, and many other people jumped in on this opportunity because we had the human genome, we had the mouse genome, that, that allows you to do pairwise comparisons, you learn something, but now here's rat. That triangulation, that getting that third species was a huge difference, and it, it was a huge challenge for the multiple uh, sequence alignments, but it, we started to really be able to delve into things. This is a, uh, one of the figures from that paper, and, and keeping track of uh, sort of the bookkeeping of where all the sequences were, what their uh, evolutionary history was, and so forth. And the kind of bottom take-home message from all of that 
question was a slide, which I, I'm sure I made 10 years ago. Uh, he looks a lot more mature now. Uh, but, uh, uh, the, uh, well, take, a, take a human mouse and, and rat genomes, <coughs> and uh, uh, it was an accomplishment to get multi-Z to, to do the three-way alignments, and now there are other really terrific uh, alignment tools. But that did take you to this intersection of the three <laughs> genomes, about a third of the genome that we could align. And we thought, well, that's, that's going to be everything that's important. That's, that was my take on it, right? You know, the stuff that is uh, uh, strongly conserved. But then we noticed there was a lot of stuff that looked pretty neutral, rapidly changing sequences, ancestral repeats and such like, that were also in here. And, and that started a whole, um, uh, a, a lot of work to not only just <coughs> not only look at the alignments, but to interpret alignments in terms of signatures of selection of uh, constraint over long periods of time or uh, adaptive change. A and and that, that, that has uh, stood up well. We, we were estimating uh, uh, about 145 megabases, the, the green part being uh, actually important or functional, and, and another species actually takes you down to a subset of that. So one thing that <laughs> becomes clear over the last 10 years is I was a little loose with my language there. Uh, it, and that looseness of language will come back uh, through the, uh, uh, in the talk. It was our, my mindset was that if it was this deeply conserved, that, that was equivalent to functional. But maybe other things are functional. In fact, we're, we're, there's ample uh, evidence now of signatures of activity that might be important in these outer sets. But anyway, it certainly is constrained in this, uh, and, and that, that part is, is an important subset of the genome. Just as a, another example of you know, what happens you know, over the, the last 10 years, this is another figure from the rat genome paper. And uh, again, there's a huge amount of effort went into the alignments and the analysis. <laughs> and uh, th this is actually uh, one exon of a gene, PEX14, I think, which uh, uh, is involved in uh, uh, peroxisome biogenesis. And, and this, is a, uh, this little tracing here was one of those interpretations of the alignments in terms of uh, constraint. And you can see things going up and down, but being up high like that means it's under strong constraint. And we came up with some other ways of trying to uh, uncover, in fact, predict cis regulatory modules based on patterns of the alignments. And that actually was useful, but it very low resolution compared to what you can get now. So this was a, a screenshot I took a, a, a day or two ago. At now in instead of having three species contributing, there are 100 vertebrates and, and, and uh, species in, in, in this alignment. And you can see uh, 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 these potentially uh, constrained or likely constrained regions all along there. But of course, you also have lots of information, uh, epigenomic features, which really are strongly correlated with uh, 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 regulatory function. So if you can get all of this, why do you need the interspecies alignments? And if you've got gums and gods of, of, of genomes, you know, why is any one particular genome any better than another? So well, let, well, let's uh, uh, proceed along looking at that. Th there is a, uh, uh, just in terms of how, you would, how best to go about predicting cis-regulatory modules, uh, uh, should you use comparative genomics or epigenomics, and I don't think there's any question but what you ought to use uh, the epigenomic features uh, to get some comprehensive signatures for candidate, candidate regulatory regions. But don't forget about the, the uh, evolutionary uh, analysis. Obviously, you learn func uh, something about the history but you get some unexpected functional insights, and I'll try to show you some examples of that. So um, I, I don't want to belabor this, but just to uh, give you a picture of what I mean by these epigenetic uh, uh, features that, that are being ascertained by any number of people, including us, uh, it, the, uh, uh, your basic enhancers and repressors and, and, and so forth are, uh, are collections of motifs for transcription factor uh, binding transcription factors, not every motif instance is bound. In fact, it's only about one in 500 or one in 1,000 are bound. So you really need to know which ones are actually bound by the factors. And of course, this is all happening in the context of chromatin. And these uh, tails, histone tails, have characteristic uh, modifications on them 
for I each of these uh, uh, classes of uh, uh, regulatory regions. And, and all of this can be ascertained, uh, mapped with high resolution and, and accuracy if, uh, if you have antibodies against the histone modifications or the transcription factors. And uh, we do that just like many other people do that. This is just one locus, one example of a, of a gene that encodes the anion transporter in your erythrocyte uh, membrane. And this is an RNA-seq uh, uh, track, and you see a nice robust signal for the RNA. And, and, and you, you, you can, enjoy, well, I enjoy <laughs> and learn from these uh, maps of binding by particular transcription factors. Uh, you can see at least three cis regulatory modules right here, uh, one right on top of the uh, uh, promoter and one upstream, one internal. And you can read off, you, one can interpret these histone modifications like, as uh, uh, being active chromatin, uh, this is around the, the promoter, and this is a, 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 a this sh shows where RNA polymerase has been uh, uh, transcribing. So what do you do with that information? Well, you can try to s uh, synthesize all of this into uh, integrative maps that where you can predict regulatory regions, and some of these methods work pretty well. This is uh, some work that was done within the ENCODE project consortium, and th there were several ways people used to uh, integrate those different histone modifications to come up with uh, uh, predictions of discrete regions based on the histone modifications thought to be I enhancers. Uh, later, there was even more chip seek done, and, and this one looks really juicy. It had a SP300, a coactivator on it. But just, just even looking at the histone modifications, you can make a prediction that this guy might be active. And uh, there were several assays that were run on some of these uh, 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 predicted cis-regulatory modules. The prettiest and most dramatic ones were done by Joachim Wittbrot, uh, and then um, Ewan Burney was the, sort of the liaison to, to, to get these uh, uh, assays done. And, and, and wh what was done was just to take those predicted cis regulatory modules and put them upstream of a, a green fluorescent protein gene, inject that into Madaka fish. This is Madaka fish, so you can have this, uh, these are live fish looking at fluorescence in them. And if you could start the moving, we can uh, uh, take a look at, at some of this. And uh, th this was predicted to be an erythroid enhancer, and sure enough, you can see here in the blood vessels, little now green, uh, erythrocytes glowing green and moving through the circulation. And, and I particularly like this movie because you can see the, the heart beating up in there. So uh, th you can use tho those histone modifications uh, for uh, accurate predictions of uh, uh, cis regulatory modules. We wanted to look a little more closely at well, not only histone modifications, but also some of the transcription factors, and, and look, get a better idea of how accurate the, the predictions of enhancers were. Uh, and again, and, and in the system that we're looking at, it's actually a differentiating uh, system from uh, committed uh, uh, erythroid progenitors all the way out to uh, uh, these very mature erythroblasts. And, and, and this is a the RNA-seq, uh, you can see the changes over time going from almost no expression to a lot of expression. And, and we were really monitoring these uh, uh, binding sites for these transcription factors. And previous studies had already shown that this transcription factor, Tau1, was often called SCL, uh, along with GATA1, was strongly associated with induction of expression in erythroid cells. So. Uh, my graduate student, Nergis Doan, uh, decided to have a look uh, at, at uh, these Tau1-occupied DNA segments. There were a little less than 5,000 of them genome-wide in this, the particular cells that we were looking at. And she wanted to see, are these guys uh, frequently uh, active as enhancers? And she ran, uh, not a Madaka fish assay, but a, a traditional uh, uh, transient transfection assay in some uh, 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 in erythroid cells, looking for production, uh, a boost in the expression of firefly luciferase under the control of the DNA segment that bound to, to tau one, and she did this with you know lots of biological and technical replicates. Did it many many times. This is an example of something we'd consider a, 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 a positive versus the negative controls, and um, they work pretty well. As if, if you just set twofold 
as your uh, threshold, a twofold increase of a, a threshold for calling something uh, uh, an enhancer, 56% uh, uh, fall into that. And some of them are really whopping big, you know, like 20 fold uh, boosts. And th th these are statistically significant, but kind of hanging around the threshold. And then these guys are clearly not active in this enhancer, uh, as enhancers in this assay. So 56%, that's pretty good by uh, a lot of standards. I was pretty happy with that. But what's going on with those 34%? I mean, is, is the assay not really a, a good one or uh, uh, you know, for the enhancers? Or is it, a, uh, I mean, is it missing things? Or uh, could, is, are there ways we could improve this? Well, happily, Lim Pinocchio, Axel Wiesel, and others at uh, Lawrence, uh, Lawrence Berkeley Labs have been very busy assaying lots of DNA segments uh, for enhancer activity in transgenic mice. And we got together with them and mined their data to, it, it turns out there were 64 of our Tau1 occupied segments they'd already tested, and a lot of them were active. In fact, the, the percentage is a little bit higher than the 70, 56% uh, uh, we got in the transient transfections. So, here again, a different assay, uh, we're getting a, 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 we're discovering enhancer activity at a very high rate, but it's not 100% of them. And I said, uh, oh, and, and th there were, uh, so some of these uh, were, were tested in, in common, uh, the, the, th these were nine uh, 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 DNA segments that were tested but in the transient mouse assay that we also did in our transient transfections. And, and, and uh, and a lot of these act as erythroid enhancers as well. Well, see, I said, uh, we, can s we can get closer to 100%, and everybody knows how to do this. We'll just inter we'll bring in more information, right? We'll just bring in histone modifications, right? We'll look at the, uh, this uh, H3K4 monomethyl to trimethyl ratio. This has uh, uh, more monomethyl, this has more trimethyl, so you think these are promoters and these might be more enhancers. They all have tau one, but they have different levels. The, this is the heat map of the occupancy. And, uh, and some of them have got, have got a one and some of them don't. And, and like these guys that we thought would be promoters, they actually are pretty close to the start site and so forth. And, and, and this is just a k-means, this is a k-means clustering on that. And I, uh, I would have bet most any amount of money that uh, cluster four is going to be the winner. It's got the, the highest activity for all of these, and you know, we, we, and that's how we were going to uh, zoom in to figure out uh, what the best enhancer predictions are, <laughs> and that's why you do experiments. Uh, Nergis uh, uh, showed me that I was wrong. That, that, that in fact, almost all t taking about seven or eight uh, uh, examples from each one of these clusters, we get a between fifty and seventy percent. Uh, uh, activity rates uh, uh, all across them. Uh, cluster four was my favorite, but it's actually sitting right there at 50%. A lot of nice enhancers, but a lot of guys that aren't. The only thing that really came out from this is the, uh, the DNA segments that didn't have much GATA1, did, weren't active very well. I said, well, that's weird. Uh, and, and well, we P300, we'll put in P300. We had that those data were available from the Snyder lab, but uh, well, I'm sorry, I, I missed that. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, th that was from the transient transfections. We, you can uh, 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 categorize the stuff from the transgenic mice the same way. And almost all of these uh, uh, clusters uh, that, that, that I mentioned before are also active in that transgenic mouse assay as well. Uh, and, and, and like P300 didn't really make a di much difference. So I. <laughs> What I've come around to realize is that you know tau one's a pretty good predictor, and all these other uh, things which you think might uh, help in predicting cis regulatory modules don't really help much beyond uh, knowing that there's tau one. Now again, this is all conditional on the fact that we already uh, had tau one bound. Um, please don't mistake what I'm saying. I'm not saying P three hundred doesn't matter or the histone modifications don't matter. I'm just saying that once you've determined but you've already got a hot uh, uh, um, uh, marker for enhancers. The other guys really don't help much. So at least in this fairly primitive approach to integration, we're not really improving our uh, 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 enhancer predictions very much. So, but certainly tau one, so if you, this is just looking at with and without each one of these features and uh, everything that you uh, 
would associate, and, and the literature says, uh, is uh, associated with enhancement, r really is. Uh, so it's not that we're crazy, uh, at least I hope we're not crazy. Um, and, and I don't want to belabor this, but you know, it, obviously one, one looks for uh, uh, motifs that are in the enhancer active versus inactive ones, and you can find some motifs, and any of these uh, proteins or these families are candidates for further I examination. But we've actually started out a long time ago looking more at conservation. Is conservation going to help us get to a, a better look at the um, at, at what's actually a uh, uh, an enhancer? And this was actually a little it's either disappointing or challenging, depending on how you want to look at it. So this is just looking at at. Uh, uh, the, some commonly used uh, scores that the higher the score, the more likely something is under constraint. And, and just looking at, at, at the distribution of, uh, of these uh, constraint scores for the tau unoccupied segments. And basically, most of them are pretty low. And in fact, an awful lot, well, so <laughs> we'll be coming back to, to that more I in a moment. Now, you, you then if you just uh, look at the uh, uh, constraint score versus the activity, well, you can see some positive association in there, and some of those comparisons are marginally significant, but it's not a whopping effect. You can certainly get very high activity in, in, uh, in the face of low constraint. Just th that's looking constraint across the entire, say, 200 to 400 base pair regions. Maybe one should look a little more focused. I mean, remember, is the, the, as you all know, the transcription factors are binding to cognate motifs, which are pretty short. And, and uh, if you look through these alignments, you can see this is for a, a, a protein called GATA1, it's binding site, but you can sometimes you see deep preservation and strong binding there. This is another site, equally strong binding, and it's present in <laughs> mouse, but not in, in, in rat. So uh, let's look more carefully at, th so this would be an example of what I mean by constrained uh, motifs. Uh, uh, and does that make a, a difference? And that actually does. So this would be uh, looking at in enhancer activity of DNA fragments oh, uh, and either, well, well so sometimes you don't even find the motif, but if the motif is there, does it show constraint or does it not? And does that make a difference in, in the, uh, activity, and, and sure enough, that is a significant difference uh, between those. And, and in fact, we had uh, shown some that on a s smaller scale uh, earlier. So there's a signature, at least if you use the evolutionary analysis in a very focused way, you could get some more information. Well, let's, that was from this one system. Now let's look out a lot more broadly. Let's look at um, regulatory landscape really across the whole mouse genome and comparing that with humans. And this is now all work that was done by various groups within the Mouse ENCODE Consortium. And, and I like this d display to sort of lay out the, the, the basic result. And, and Ogert Danas did this with James Taylor with some help from various other people. And, and, and well, actually, just to start w w with this diagram, this is your, your, your human DNA here. This would be mouse. You can think about it as rat, if you, if you wish. And, uh, and, the deep and these little ellipses are places where you have hypersensitive sites or factor binding or something like that. So you, you let the whole genome sequence alignments tell you that this segment's orthologous to this one, this one's orthologous to that one, and so forth. And sometimes, when you bring those orthologous segments together, you also align the sequences that they're bound by a, a, a particular transcription factor in both cases. And, and other times that doesn't happen. And so what was being shown here, well, let's just look at, the, at, at this uh, Venn diagram. Uh, this is like the, the entire space bound by transcription factors. All the sequences bound by transcription factors in human, this is all the ones bound in, in, in mouse. And it's only as, well, well, first of all, how much of that, if, I will, if you will, regulatory DNA even aligns between mouse and human? It's about 40%. And that's true for factor binding sites or, or hypersensitive sites. And of those, even, even within the stuff that aligns, those are the, the, these outer sects, 
the places where you see conservation of occupancy, that is the orthologous sequences bound by orthologous uh, transcription factors in both species, is pretty small, maybe 10% uh, here. And it varies a lot from uh, protein to protein. Now, the fact that that was happening was no surprise, and, and Paul Flynn-Check is here. I can't really see, see him now, but Paul's here, and, and with Duncan Odom, uh, he, had, he had told us this for liver uh, factors, you know, four or five liver factors uh, uh, over the last few years, and um, uh, CTCF actually uh, it shows more conservation of occupancy, but uh, uh, it, it, the fact that a lot of, a lot of the regulatory landscape isn't conserved the way that we were expecting, that had been reported, and we're seeing it in spades. So uh, the, our, our contribution is to <laughs> expand to more tissues and, and, and a lot more uh, uh, transcription factors, lo looking, mapping in mouse, mapping in human. Here's just a whole bunch of transcription factors uh, done uh, in a B cell, B lymphocyte model or a, a erythroid model. And, and uh, these diagrams uh, uh, are, are heat maps, and, and, and they're keep keeping showing you are they tend to be binding more start site proximal or distal or, or in between. A and the overall pattern of where the orthologous proteins bind is largely preserved. There's one notable exception, but for the most part, if it's start site proximal in human, it's start site proximal in mouse. But how much of that conservation is preserved? So th this is basically showing this diagram again. The sequence, underlying sequences tend to be conserved, but the fact that this is kind of faded out relative to this is telling us a small fraction of, uh, 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 of the bound sites uh, in uh, mouse. If you look for at their orthologs, you don't see them being bound. Uh, it, there are some, again, CTCF, actually everything that's part of that cohesin uh, complex is, is, tends to be more preserved, but a lot of things change a lot. Wow, well does that mean, you know, that, that the regulatory landscape really uh, is of uh, change so much that you can't extrapolate from mouse to human or rat to human? I'm gonna say no, but it's not as simple. It's not as simple as, as, as the uh, um, you know, genome sequence alignments, which themselves aren't simple, but anyway, let, let's, let's look some more at this. There, um, at least this isn't blank. There are some, a subset of the bound sites are conserved in their occupancy between uh, mouse and humans, and they behave very differently than other bound sites. That's, that's an, imp uh, an important take-home message, and I'll explain what that difference is. So this is just an example of uh, orthologous sequences bound in, uh, They'll be bound in mouse and bound in human. These are nice uh, binding signals. If you look at the alignments, you see this beautiful, deep preservation of the motifs. What happens when you stick those into, uh, uh, it, to do the uh, transient transgenic mouse assay? So and, and there again, you're taking your, uh, the, the DNA sequence that you see is, has conserved occupancy and you put it upstream from a, a lac -Z reporter, and, and this we did with the uh, Lynn Pinocchio, and, uh, and, and you look at this day 11 and a half uh, embryos in, in mouse and ask, do you see particular tissues lighting up in a reproducible pattern? And, and you do, you see these nice blue patterns. Now, remember I said I'm, I'm studying hematopoiesis, almost all of these things were ascertained in erythroid cells. Right, uh, GATA1, tell whether these are erythroid specific. That's, uh, I believe, a heart. Uh, this is like a neural tube. This is midbrain. You know, there are all these places that are definitely not erythroid. And so this, this really was, uh, uh, uh <laughs> this was almost a showstopper, except I couldn't, I, we kept, we saw this like two years ago, and, and so what does this really mean? And we were wondering if maybe what we're, that these con really, these conserved occupancy regions, maybe they're doing something beyond what we ascertained them to be doing, you know, the, the binding sites in erythroid cells. Maybe they actually are active in multiple tissues. And the breakthrough for me was 
being able to, to look then at DNA hypersensitive sites and uh, uh, in, um, histone modifications in, in several different tissues. We can look at these tissues where the, uh, uh, the, the, the mice are lighting up, and sure enough, we can see hypersensitive sites for these lo locations. We ascertain them in erythroid cells, but they actually are also active in midbrain or in the neural tube. So the model, this is the thing that's different about conserved occupancy, at least this is a possible explanation that's consistent with the data so far, hence the model. They have pleiotropic functions. They really are active in multiple tissues. That, I mean, that one, one wants to see a lot more data, but that's what we're working from. If it's pleiotropic, it's under stronger constraint. It's, it has multiple angles of constraint and maybe that's what it takes to get preservation of occupancy despite the fact that most of the regulatory landscape is changing. Now, this is not the majority bound sites. It's 10, maybe 20 percent. If you're looking at cohesion uh, subunits, it's way more than that. And I, and I think that's something to, uh, to try to work from. More specifically, I didn't get into this very much, but GATA1 is one of the proteins that we look at. The one is significant. There are actually six GATA orthologs. They're expressed in different tissues, uh, the, the different orthologs. And where we're seeing these um, DNA segments uh, that we're ascertaining by binding uh, transcription factors in erythroid cells, when they light up in transgenic mice, they tend to be some of these tissues where some of the other orthologs are. And we're wondering if that's how the pleiotrope is working, that, that, that uh, different GATA factors use the same DNA segment in different tissues, presumably, presumably for different targets. We don't know that, but that's the idea. Pleiotrope might be at the root of, 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 of the, that subset of occupancy that's strongly preserved. Now, oh good, I still have some more time. The, all of these issues, these issues about uh, you know, that, that I've been talking about in terms of trying to understand hematopoiesis, and it just so happens in, in, in mouse, and, 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 you know, starting with a wonderful uh, a basis in multiple sequence alignments from lots of different species, but now uh, uh, in, enjoying this uh, onslaught of epigenomic information and trying to utilize that. This ties into a current debate that is uh, getting a fair bit of uh, attention and heat. And, and so I want to uh, bring, bring in, in, in the, these issues, bring in a, another perspective on this and then try to tie it all up to together about translating from model organisms to, to human. So um, one thing that the ENCODE Project Consortium is famous for or infamous for, and uh, got a lot of attention for, and is getting a lot of heat for, is uh, uh, claiming that there's evidence of uh, function pervasive through the uh, human genome. Uh, and there are some folks who feel like we greatly overestimated that. Now, uh, when those that text was being written, I thought we were safe by just saying that, well, we've, we've got an operational definition of function that is a reproducible biochemical signature, uh, right? It, it, so it, and I thought, well, that's okay, but I mean, really, just the fact that something's transcribed, the fact that, that a DNA segment's being transcribed is really rather different than something being a promoter or coding for a protein or whatever. Uh, but anyway, if, if you look for evidence of biochemical activity, uh, you do find a lot of the genome uh, get, getting lit up in human, mouse, whatever. Given the way that we look at alignments now and, and trying to evaluate whether or not an alignment reflects uh, a level of change that's consistent with uh, neutral evolution or is significantly deviating from it, it's a much smaller fraction uh, that, that we would say is clearly under selection. And 
it's really hard to go much for human uh, genome much above 15 percent if you're looking at uh, an alignment-based uh, constraint kind of calculation, whereas you can easily hit 80 percent for, for the biochemically active. And of course, what you'd really like to know is what can generate a phenotype upon perturbation, and that is deliberately put in in a very diffuse way because it's very hard to know. But that those are the kind of the ideas. And different uh, uh, regulatory regions show different uh, um, uh, collections of, of the, these features. So, uh, so one of the strongest erythroid enhancers uh, ever discovered, and this is part of the beta globin locus control region, although these, are, uh, these genes encode beta globins, which uh, uh, the make half of the hemoglobin in your uh, red cells. And, and you do need this locus control region marked by multiple uh, hypersensitive sites for to, to drive any of these uh, genes in erythroid cells. So if you focus in on this one, you, first of all, if you look at the constraint uh, uh, pattern here, you see these nice peaks and valleys of constraint, and the constraint goes right on with bound segments mapped, actually way before ENCODE, <laughs> uh, uh, for, for all these factors. If you take the DNA, uh, 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 DNA-seq data and, and you go deeply enough, you can actually see these patterns of the DNAs hitting in between the binding sites over here. So it's a really beautiful uh, 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 example of constraint, biochemical signal, and uh, it's active in both gain of function and, and loss of function uh, uh, assays. I thought all enhancers would look like that, but of course they don't. And then there are lots of others. So this, is, this has been known almost as long as that one. And <laughs> It does not have a signature of constraint because it's primate specific and it's, uh, it's a lot of it's generated by a, a long term repeat. It, it is an active enhancer. Here's a, um, uh, another region that is really hard to, to, for me to really say, well, how, you know, how important really is it? But the overall process that it's involved in really is important. This is one of several places within this cluster that BCL11A binds to, which is a repressor for the, um, uh, th these genes in the uh, adult life. And that, the fact that BCL11A is doing that may be the best avenue for uh, therapeutic intervention based on, on what people have learned over the last 30 years. So it, it, you have a, a, a lots of diversity here. So what else, so as, as you kind of rethink the, all the, these issues of, and, and, and uh, looking at uh, signal strength and conservation, there are some things that I think are, are worth pointing out. So when ENCODE finds 75% uh, of the genome being covered by uh, or reads for uh, 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 RNA-seq, either poly-A plus or poly-A minus, uh, th th there's more data now and, and, the, and people in the consortium are, are recalculating this, but you see th the strong colors, actually for, for any of these features, the strong colors are, uh, the colors you can see easily reflect very high signals. And you see they are covering fairly small fractions of the genome. Is you get those really large fractions of the genome by including the low level, highly reproducible, I must say, is reproducible, but, but, but pretty low signal levels. And you know, if you tie that in, and this is some work that, uh, well, I, I should mention specifically, this was Yorgi Marinov with uh, 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 Barbara Wold who did these graphs, but it was all within the consortium. Then Luke Ward with the Manolis Kellis did this next analysis. It's really striking. So we, 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 you, I just showed you signal strength varies enormously. What happens when you look at the level of con conservation? Well, it's, 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 it just, just look at this lower panel. As the, the signal strength goes higher, you get more and more uh, signal for the constraint. So, in fact, these, um, where am I going with that? The, the, the various approaches that one can take whether it's the direct uh, biochemical uh, uh, assessment, of assessment of biochemical activity, um, genetic approaches, the 
uh, or, or the, the evolutionary approaches, they actually do converge in some interesting ways that I think we're only now starting to wrestle with and, and try to, uh, to learn more from. Uh, and and, and the, the fact that the signal strength goes with the constraint, I mean, is satisfying, but we, that wasn't known before, right? You know, and, and, and when you, if, if you're looking, you, if you're looking at uh, epigenomic information, say in, in a, a, a tissue that's, that's relevant for you, and you look at a particular transcription factor you know is important, and there's like 20,000 places that it binds are all 20,000 of them doing something that you need to be paying attention to? I, you know, so here are some these other approaches, I think, really are uh, helping to, to guide you towards a, a, at least a subset to start with. Now, let me, uh, I have a few uh, sort of summary uh, uh, comments to make here. So in, in terms of uh, that, that section of the talk where I was talking about uh, trying to find cis-regulatory modules, well, uh, I don't think it was, was news, but I was, I'm glad to have the opportunity <laughs> to show you our approach to this, that maps of epigenetic features across these uh, uh, genomes can be used to uh, uh, generate really interesting candidate regulatory regions, which often actually are active. Oh, and, and <laughs> by the way, on this thing of, uh, you know, how much of the genome really is active, you know, the, the best thing about ENCODE isn't whether or not it's estimating how much of the genome is uh, uh, functional, it's really the maps. That, that the maps are the things that are most important. Uh, something that surprised me was that it, it's not a trivial matter to integrate multiple strong predictors, that one strong predictor like tau1 uh, can, can, can trump uh, 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 additional ones. But at least, you know, if you find those strong predictors, run with them. And uh, trying to get beyond say 75%, which would seem to be, at least in, in our lab, seems to be the ceiling that we're, we're hitting. Uh, there are lots of ideas that we can uh, toss around. I mean, <laughs> of course, it's, it, it's hard to get past uh, the fact that maybe you're not doing the right functional assay and, and having more high throughput assays would be really terrific. Uh, maybe there's some epigenetic feature that we're missing that we're not uh, looking at. Uh, but m maybe we should, we'll kind of go back to some of our roots and, and look harder at, at those evolutionary signatures uh, in there. Do insights about gene regulation gleaned in one species translate to another? And yes, but not in all aspects. So some of the stuff you already, you already know, but let's, it's, it's helpful just to restate them. I don't know of any big changes in the rules of regulation between mouse and rat and, uh, uh, and humans. Certainly, orthologous transcription factors we know for a long time are employed, and they seem to be employed in different ways. But if you get down to positional specificity, you look at where those proteins are acting, now you see a fair bit of difference. And some of that is uh, lineage-specific function, some of it is uh, a process we refer to as turnover of, you know, losing a motif here while another motif shows up close by. Exaptation, which is, uh, I didn't get into, but some of these places where you can see what's a functional region in, in mouse and you can map it to an orthologous region, but you don't find orthologous function, you can find another function there. It might be used in another tissue, which that was a surprise to me. Now, when you do see conservation of uh, occupancy, pay attention and look to see if it's, if, if it's actually a, 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 a pleiotropic uh, activity. And so the evolutionary approaches could be really helpful in, say, you got 20,000 sites to look at and maybe that's, you just know that's too many. Well, pay attention to the conservation. And uh, just a, a few little uh, ending co comments here on uh, directions forward. You know, the, there's been a lot of heat about uh, the, the, the differences between what you see from evolutionary approaches versus biochemical. A and and it kind of comes across as which one's right and which one's wrong. And that is just the wrong way to look at it. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of, no matter what community is talking about this, if you really press them to define precisely what you mean by function, it gets hard. 
it really is hard to say precisely what you mean by that. And maybe function is this kind of amorphous thing that we're all trying to get at, and we kind of feel like we, we know what it is, but seriously, I mean, this is maybe a no-brainer, but I just wanted to say it. Use all the approaches and, 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 s and s try to see what this function is that, that it can lead you to. Now, I was trying to think of something profound and provocative. Of course, when you try to do that, you don't, <laughs> right? But, but, but uh, this might be helpful. This all started with alignments. Well, everything I've done in, in genomics started with alignments. And what is an alignment? We, well, we I always go right back to thinking, well, it's these, um, uh, is, you know, is these uh, 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 rows that are all brought into alignment, but uh, and, and we learn things from that, but what is it? Well, it's a mapping of one sequence onto another, and you can put in spacers or whatever, and it, but, but you, you do this mapping, and that mapping, how that happens is uh, you can get optimality or, or, or close to optimal solutions if you use scoring schemes. And those scoring schemes, you know, wh wh what counts more, uh, you know, matches count more, mismatches count less. It's all based pretty much on coding regions. What if we rethought the whole scoring scheme? Not from coding sequences, which we've got pretty good control over or understand, but maybe we ought to rethink it in terms of the evolutionary patterns in regulatory regions. You can have different kinds of alignments for different functional uh, elements. Allow for turnover, in, allow for indels in, in ways that uh, might work better. Now this might be, I'm pretty sure this is tractable because it, I, I remember Webb Miller doing stuff like, <laughs> like, uh, 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 like some, of some of those ideas. But beyond that, you can align anything that's in common between the two, right? And maybe we should think, rethink uh, alignments and, and going more for uh, other things. So now these uh, vector binding site motifs, uh, uh, that, that is, yes, that's related to the sequence, but you could set up an alignment strategy among mammals that really focus on this. And, and actually there have been some papers uh, uh, about this, but I haven't seen it hit uh, really the big time. Because epigenomics is going like gangbusters in all kinds of species. Maybe we ought to be doing alignments, not sequence-based, but more track-based, you know, trying to align the, the histone modifications. A and, and, and it can go uh, even beyond that. I mean, so it really comes down to, you know, regulation as far as we, we always think about in terms of gene regulatory networks and things. And uh, are there ways to do alignments of networks between species? And I think... So there's some really nifty computational challenges within this, but I think it's also a good chance, uh, 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 good opportunities for interactions between bench scientists and uh, computational scientists to, to pursue this, and in a way to try to get the best way of harvesting the information from model systems and, and, and uh, mo moving it into to humans. So that's what I was trying to drive at. I, I should. I did mention a few people along the way, but I got to say, you know, uh, uh, obviously I don't do the hard work, and, and, and I've been blessed with a lot of really great um, uh, students, and, and I've been showing some data from Weixing uh, Wu here and, and, and Nurkis, but all these folks have done a terrific job. I'm co I <laughs> learned so much from my collaborators, and uh, I, I thank them all, and of course for our support from NIDDK and NHGRI. I really appreciate your attention, and uh, I'd be delighted to, uh, either answer questions or listen to your comments. Very nice talk. Uh, it Thank really you. brought a lot of things into context. So I was wondering, uh, when you, most of what you've been looking at, most of your algorithms, uh, mm -hmm. look at uh, linear DNA alignments. Mm -hmm. But if you try to think about uh, when you try to predict enhancers, et cetera, on uh, three-dimensional uh, alignment, uh, through C or whatever, pi C, uh, 
are you going to come to some different conclusions? Because it really matters where they are in space, not where they are on a linear array. Yeah. Absolutely, that's a terrific point. Uh, you could, um, and not only does it matter where you are in space, but where things are in space on which length scale. Right? I mean, you, you, get, you get very different ideas about interaction frequencies when you talk to people who look at chromosome territories, right? And, you know, one chromosome occupying one part of the nucleus versus what you can kind of get down to with these uh, uh, topologically, um, topologically associated domains, that the, the TADs that, that you can get from a few different uh, ways. And, and I think it's within the subdomains that you get a lot of that movement kind of back and forth between promoters and enhancers. And uh, at the very least, if we could get better information, more complete information about that, we would at least get better assignments of what the gene targets are for all of these bound regions, which, you know, I only showed you one example where it was kind of like really obvious, but that is not a solved problem, right? Uh, uh, yeah, so, so yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, try, trying to get in that third dimension. It, it's so much of it's just like wrapped up in in, in, the, in, in the figuring out what the, the target is. So, but I I haven't uh, I, I'm I'm not aware of a whole lot of work, work beyond that. But I'm, I'm it, it's there, right? It needs to be done. Um, it's it's really good calc. Um, now, my question here is, uh, do you know any uh, sort of a good uh, alignment comparison between mouse and uh, rat? Um, whether that will be a good uh, topic or field to look into. And uh, second is uh, when you talk about alignment of uh, non-coding region, uh, could you make some comments on maybe alignment of non-coding RNAs or things like that? Okay, yeah, so the... Uh Pretty good whole genome alignments can be done between almost any mammal and are being done. And, and there's, a, there's a, a very nice algorithms that the acronyms EPO that uh, the uh, European Bioinformatics Institute runs. Uh, and and that, that's, I'm pretty sure that's at the heart of the, what you find in Ensemble. And, uh, and there's another uh, way of doing alignments that this you find at the Santa Cruz browser, and, and those are. Uh, that, 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 that those started with Webb Miller, but the, um, uh, and, and so those are being done sort of in an automated way. Oh, um, I, don't know, here's a, I don't know how often people announce this, but the, uh, the multiples, y for pairwise alignments, you actually can guarantee optimality, but you go three and beyond, and, and it's, you cannot guarantee an optimal solution. And, and it's, all, it's, it's affected by gobs of parameters, which some people worry about. But uh, what you get off the shelf may not be the best for your, uh, it's good, but it may not be the best for, for what you want to do. And if you want to look at long non-coding RNAs, yeah, you got a nice challenge there. Because <laughs> there, I mean, there are lots of them. And you know, a lot of them, seem to be sequence specific, I'm, I'm sorry, species specific. Uh, and and are, do we think that because they really are species specific or is, are the alignments not really bringing that out? I, I, right now I'm more in the former, that there's, uh, uh, we, we see a lot more uh, genetic, a, a lot more evolutionary change in, in uh, non-coding RNAs than we do in coding RNAs. Uh, and I probably didn't stress this really enough, but coding sequences don't change much over the, what we're talking about. A lot of the regulatory landscape does change. And, and, and unless you've got some really s strong constraint on it, it, it it'll, it'll, it, it'll change. There might be things that are <laughs> analogous between species, right? You, you know, and those are much harder to find, and, but it doesn't mean they can't be found. But it's a real challenge to the alignment community and then 
and to the experimental community. You uh, measured your uh, functionality based on, uh, I think, uh, reporter essays, mainly. Uh, yes. Are you looking also on the effects if you remove enhancers, if you then see expression changes? That's, a, that's a wonderful question. And um, uh, gain of function assays, these reporter genes are, uh, I think they're highly informative. I love them because they do tend to work at a high rate. Um, uh, loss of function assays for cis regulatory modules, or that's for the brave. <laughs> you might so, so, uh, and let me let me say a little bit more about that. It, it just there's many examples of taking a, uh, uh, an enhancer that that's just gangbusters in multiple assays, strongly constrained, all this, and you take it away, and nothing happens. And there's some fairly well-known papers about this. I have no idea how many data sets are gathering dust in labs, you, you know, who, who, who did the same thing, right? Because it is hard to publish no phenotypes. A and, you know, this redundancy and all these other things. Uh, but I actually, actually, there is a, one of the postdocs with uh, Lynn Pinocchio. Uh, I don't think I've seen this published yet, but I know they've talked about it, like, in national meetings. And... Uh, she also got this no func no phenotype from knocking out something that really looked like an enhancer, but she went in it. I, I think it was, it was some cranial facial thing, and, and so she like measured the, the, the distances between the. the she did did a lot of morphometric analyses. Did deep phenotyping. I think Jonathan Flint likes deep phenotyping, right? If you look hard, she looked really really hard, and she actually did see something. So I, I think it, it could all come together, but uh, make sure you got the resources and some time if you're going to do it. One, one more. So maybe it ended on a little philosophical note. So <laughs> you're talk, you know, the points you make about uh, pleiotropy. Mm -hmm. So you want to sort of philosophically comment on, you know, the battle between this pleiotropic effect and specificity of uh, these of the GATA family and how things might work. Is it a matter of controlling the GATAs uh, so you avoid the pleiotropy and get specificity? Because you get negative uh, pleiotropic effects, which are fairly common if you don't control for it somehow with specificity. Oh, um, that's a really good question, and I would love to hear your comments <laughs> on it. I, I haven't really thought it through. Uh, I, I think you're, yeah, this, it's, it's a hard question. Yeah, but it's, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't have any, anything to say about it. Ma maybe later we can get uh, together and <laughs> I might get more creative a little bit later. <laughs> so maybe my uh, question is a little bit easier if I'm over here. Oh, oh hi. Um, mm -hmm. So do you have any ideas um, what the ultra conserved elements are actually doing? Because, I mean, you were talking a lot about evolution and you, but then you were just doing the comp comparison between mice and, and man, but I mean, did you look at those specifically also, and do you have any idea of whether they do something well, from the biochemical data that you have, or? I, I, uh, which elements are you asking the about? The ultra-conserved elements. So the, oh, the, the transposable elements? No, ultra-conserved, meaning like down to uh, any like 40-way alignments, or I mean. The which one? Oh, you did ask about ultra conserved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, great! Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. And I, I am uh, just as old as I look, and my my hearing's not so good anymore. <laughs> I, apo I apologize for not catching that. The ultra conserves are just amazing, and they're a tremendous challenge for us to try to understand. And, and just to, if, if you're not, just to make sure everyone's on the same page, um, uh, uh, Gil Bergerano, when he was a postdoc with David Hausler. Um, you know, we had all these alignments between mouse and humans, and, and he had the uh, insight to look at the most preserved. The, 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 uh, it, it, he, he screened for sequences that were 200 long, 200 nucleotides long with no differences between mouse and human. Right? And, and, and you can find this uh, thing at that level of constraint and, 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 and close to it. And I don't know of any biochemical process 
that requires 200 nucleotides in a row. You know, and you, you can't change anything in it. And I, 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 there isn't anything in R that I know about in RNAs or whatever. But the, these, these exist, and, and some of them are regulatory. They are preserved through a lot. You know, so, say if you start with humans, you, you see them preserved through uh, most of the Ethereans. And, 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 and a little bit less so as you go further out. But you don't find them outside vertebrates. So this is really weird. They're more strongly conserved than coding sequences, but over a more restricted uh, 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 phylogenetic distance. So it's where some of them clearly are involved in regulation. There have been various papers that, that have uh, uh, shown some of these. And, uh, uh, but it, it understanding what puts that constraint so you all substitutions are rejected, 200 in a row. A, 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 there again, pleiotropy comes in, right? You know, that's a nice idea, but it would have to be like you know, overlapping functions all the way across. But I, I have never seen a good uh, explanation that, uh, of that's how you get that severe constraint. And so I, I consider it still an open question, but they, they sure are important, <laughs> right? There. Okay, uh, why don't we thank Dr. Hardison one more time.